I received an absolutely delightful email this morning that has prompted this video. I'll tell you what it said a little bit later. Just know that this is more of a rant than a teaching. Here's the backstory that caused the email to land well. Many years ago, there was a black pastor who was introduced at a conference as a black Christian. He very publicly, very immediately challenged his host, corrected him and said, no, I'm not a black Christian. He said, when you put black in the adjectival position, it means that my black culture modifies my Christianity. He said, that's my number one problem as a pastor. I have a church full of black Christians. He said, I am a Christian black. My Christianity modifies my black culture. Now, this is not a black problem whatsoever. We have a world of adjectives that define our Christianity. We have white Christians, we have middle class Christians, we have overseas Christians, we have Gen X Christians, we have prophetic Christians, we have Christians from the inner healing community. We have a lot of activity and focus-based Christians who allow their journey to unduly define their Christianity. And I'd like to challenge you today to separate out some different facets of your Christianity. First of all, there's the issue of design. And our streams of Christianity should be very different and distinct one from another. Where do I get that? Well, from the seven churches of Revelation. As Jesus wrote and celebrated different things about each of the churches and also rebuked them for different things. So the church at Ephesus, the prophet church, he wrote and said, I really like the fact that you expose the false prophets, the false apostles in the community. How many times have you heard that verse preached on the last 10 years? Probably zip. Problem today is as big or greater than it was back then where we have apostles right, left, and center. Most of them aren't apostles. And God celebrated a subset of Christendom at that time that was particularly active in exposing, confronting, and rejecting false apostles. So that is one expression. On the other end of the spectrum, church at Laodicea, they wouldn't expose or confront anything. They were so in the middle of the road, so inclusive, so watered down that there was no fire, no passion for any sort of division. In two of the churches, the servant church and the ruler church, Jesus commented on the intensity of the battle that they were facing and the fire and the difficulty and the challenges of just being the existential threats that were all around them. Then others, two of the others, he hammered them for their tolerance of immorality in the church. So there's room for a huge diversity in the flavors of our Christianity, but built around design and assignment and playing field, not around the pressures of the culture. So that's my first challenge to you. Take a look and come to terms with your design and the place where God has assigned you and begin to pull out of that core characteristics of your particular walk. So let's take one of those from my own walk. In this day and age, where Christianity has become glossy in many circles, I am profoundly committed to authenticity, not to artificially looking good. It's part of my brand. And you well know I share the good, the bad, and the ugly. I call my failures and my losses what they are. And 
I am committed to that as a reaction to the culture, number one. I don't like a facade on Sunday morning over a pastor that is profoundly broken and doing nothing about it. But it's also who I am. As somebody redemptive gift of profit, I value authenticity. So those two things, my design and the culture, come together in a flavor of Christianity that is highly um, non-glossy. It's where I am in my journey. Now, another layer that needs legitimately to be present in your Christianity is the reactions to your journey. Every single one of us has a unique journey. No two journeys are the same. And along the way in our journey, we are shaped and molded in the things that matter the most to us. So during the years when I was such an absolute mess, and I was also incidentally at the same time a pastor, I was looking around for mentors. I looked at the other pastors of small churches who were struggling, and I said, <laughs> I don't want to learn from them. They're in as much trouble as I am. I looked at the pastors of the big successful churches, reached out to them, and they were too busy being successful to mess with a mess like me. And then I said, aha, I've got it, the ideal. The retired pastors who have discretionary time and I have abundance of wisdom, reached out to them and was shocked at how vigorously I was slapped down because they were retired, they had boundaries, and they had ticked that box, been there, done that. They didn't do messy people anymore. I was offended. I was hurt. I was angry. And in that context, and at multiple times in the subsequent journey, I made an inner vow. I had very little hope that I would ever dig out of my silly hole, that I would ever get it together, but I made the vow that in the unlikely event I ever mounted to a hill of beans, as my mom would say, I would reach a hand back to those who were still on the journey, those who were still a mess, those who were not strategic investments for the kingdom. You know what? I've lived up to that. I'm still accessible. I still reach back a hand. I still invest in those that others are unwilling to invest in. It's legitimate for your journey, for your brand of Christianity to include some expressions of your journey, where you've been, what you value, and how you see the world. Then there is a third layer that should be very significant in your Christianity, and that is how you know God, who you know God. Each one of us has a different journey with God. And although I know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a defining moment in my life, and that was during those three years of the dark night of the soul and Christ coming to me after my Christianity had utter absolutely failed to serve me and I was a mess. And he made those two statements that have completely defined my life. He said, number one, Christianity, the way I designed it, works. There's no asterisk, none, zero, zip, zilch. Jesus Christ designed a package that worked. So from that encounter, I bring a violent rejection and reaction against powerless Christianity, regardless of the spin. If there's a problem, if Christianity is not working somewhere and it's not working in a lot of areas around me, that's not right. There has to be an answer. So that defining obsession that Christianity is made to work comes from my encounter with Jesus Christ. The second thing that he said is that doctrine, theology, is a fence to keep you safe, but you can't build with it. Shocking revelation. He said, you build with principles. Well, at that time, I didn't know a principle from a PBJ sandwich, but it made sense to me 
that coming out of a very divisive stream of the faith where we defined holiness as having more Christian enemies than somebody else because we had subdivided some truth more righteously than somebody else, and it wasn't working for me, it makes sense that there had to be a better way. So from that time on, I have looked for principles. What are the principles in the Word of God that are transactional, transformational, that work, that are portable, that can go down through multiple generations and different iterations and have legs of their own and not need a human's brand to support them. So out of my journey with a passion to find a more complete package of Christianity that works, and out of my experience of leaving a theologically centered mindset, although I still have a whole lot of doctrine and theology as a foundation, and moving into a transformational mindset, where are the principles that work and how can I activate them? That defines my Christianity. And I'm going to look at an individual, look at an email, look at an experience through the grid of where am I seeing principles at work that I can deconstruct? Or if this isn't working, what are the missing principles? That's baked into my Christianity. I look at everything through functionality, not sparkle. Does it work? Does it work across a broad section? Is it portable? What kinds of transformation can build on this transformation? My mind is continually running around principles and transformation because of that encounter with God. Now, most of you would have no disagreement whatsoever with the fact Christianity is supposed to work and that principles are important. You're not pushing back on that at all, but it's not a fire in you. Why? Because you have a different journey with God. You've encountered him in different ways. And how God has chosen to reveal himself to you absolutely should be adjectival in your Christianity. Absolutely. And it would help if you knew that. What is your core design? Where have you brought redemption out of the pain of your journey? And what do you know about God? How has God overtly revealed himself to you? And those are dynamic. Those are continually changing through life. Right now, I'm circling around one phrase that has just emerged powerfully in my heart research. I've been looking at the 800 plus verses in scripture on the heart for over a dozen years. I've got a wall plastered with post-it notes because we're closing in on the first album of Blessing Your Heart and I'm trying to organize all these thoughts. And God took me to a verse that I thought I knew well. You know the story. Solomon goes up to worship God. He was not going to get, it was not a transactional encounter with God. He was not trying to bribe God. He was just grateful for being a 20-year-old who was running an empire. I mean, amazing. He offered a bunch of sacrifices out of the overflow of his heart of gratitude. God came to him and said, wow, um, <laughs> I like your heart. What can I give you? And what I was taught, what I have taught others, what I believe is he asked for wisdom. He didn't. Not according to the scriptural record. He asked for understanding to be able to judge Israel. And that comes from watching his dad. His dad's failure to set up a judiciary because as a gift of mercy, he didn't want to be the one to tell somebody they're the bad guy, empowered Absalom's rebellion and the nation as a whole for all of its strengths had a very weak judiciary. And he said, you know, I need to fix this. I need to have the understanding to be able to establish a good judiciary and be the solitary Supreme Court for the nation. 
And God said, I like it. And oh, by the way, your understanding is not going to be effective without wisdom to go with it. You're not wise enough to know you need wisdom to go with the understanding, so I'm going to give you this package deal. But the third one, the one that's just exploding within me, is what else he gave. How many times have I read that passage? I wasn't born yesterday. I've been through the Bible bunches of times. I've read it to myself, read it out loud, had others read it to me, read it in different versions, and I've never seen what it said. God said, I'm going to give you the understanding you asked for, I'm going to give you the wisdom you didn't ask for that you need, and I'm going to give you largeness of heart. Largeness of heart. That is burning in me. That is a verse that has come alive, and I'm looking at all the post-it notes on the wall, looking at the June seminar and the presentation, and one of the things I desperately want to be able to bring about for you is largeness of heart. I'm still trying to figure out what that is. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you what, it's good. <laughs> and if we could find the principles to be transformational, to bring you from the place you are to a place where there's largeness of heart, I would be so happy. That is burning. That is a new flavor of my Christianity that wasn't there three weeks ago. And man, it's hot. Can you tell? So this rant is an encouragement to you to look at your Christianity and to find out what is cultural, what is because of your gender, what is because of your age, what is because of your parents, what is about because of the church that you have been raised in, the books that you read, the things that you listen to, how much of your Christianity is cultural? And how much of it is the reflection of the person that God designed you to be? That's a question you need to wrestle with once a year. Set aside some time on an annual basis, plan ahead, no interruptions, and examine who you are this year compared to last year and ask the question, am I more like Christ or more like the culture? Am I imprinted? Am I becoming adjectival because of the culture or because of my journey? So that's my rant. It all started with a wonderful email from a lady overseas who was celebrating the fact that I'd been engaged in her nation and done this or that, celebrating the fact that I'm in a seasonal change that God's calling me to building. It was in response to the newsletter about moving into more building. And after the celebration, she added one appeal at the end and said, Arthur, um, I value the fact that you've been in our nation and you understand some things about the challenges that we face, not just in the nation, but in her city and said, Arthur, please don't become too American. <laughs> and I roared with laughter, because I can't think of a worse epitaph on my tombstone than he was an American Christian. Horror upon horrors. Because I still react violently to American Christianity. I'm a missionary kid was raised in the jungles of northern Brazil with people who were considered highly educated if they had a third grade education. And the mission that my parents were in imported American Christianity. We had a national conference. We had delegates that were elected by each of the churches. And I remember as a kid sitting there watching the missionaries coach the moderator in how to run the meeting according to Robert's rules of order in the jungles of Brazil. As a kid, I knew something wasn't right. Robert's rules of order are not the 67th book of the Bible, just not. And how can we be so arrogant as to import that much of American culture into a foreign nation and impose it on them on a par with biblical mandates? Absolute obscenity. So from that violent, visceral 
rejection of American Christianity exported by missions, I stand here looking askance at American Christianity, knowing that I am American by God's choice and birth, knowing that I spent 10 years doing laps around the world over 100,000 miles every year for 10 years, and that now's a new season when I'm primarily assigned to the playing field of America, not exclusively, but primarily, but that season of assignment doesn't mean I'm to become an American Christian. I will continue to be a vigorous, relentless, articulate critic of American as an adjectival word modifying Christianity in a thousand ways. No, 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 no. That is not the Christianity that Jesus Christ came to establish in the world. It is Christianity that has American and a whole lot of other toxic adjectives in front of it. Christianity was made to be adjectival. It was made to modify our culture, to impact our gender, our worldview, our politics, our economics, our health care, how we parent, how we create legacy, how we work, how we lead. In every way, Christianity is designed to be adjectival, and the enemy works hard, hard, hard to infiltrate myriad adjectives and or Christianity. So this rant is a challenge to you to stop being American Christians or whatever other adjectival problems you have and to sit down and say, who am I by design? What is my assigned playing field? What in my journey has caused me to elevate one truth above another in some way or another? And then finally, how has God uniquely chosen to reveal himself to me? If you will wrestle with those four questions now and wrestle with them again every year, it will make you a vastly better person, better Christian, more transformational in the kingdom than the horrors of being an American Christian. An epitaph that I could celebrate, he knew his king. Because my encounters with Jesus have been absolutely, fundamentally transformational. I know the Father. I know how he establishes legitimacy for somebody who is used a whole lot of legitimacy crutches, based a whole lot of false legitimacy and loss of legitimacy on stupidity. I know that facet of Father. I know the elbows of the Holy Spirit and the fun, fun, wild journey of power and of intimacy as I walk with the Holy Spirit. I know my God and my knowledge of God based on how God has chosen to reveal himself to me is a far bigger modifier of my Christianity than the American culture. So Liz, loved your email, no worries. I am not anywhere in danger of becoming an American Christian, even though I'm assigned to work here in America. Thanks Liz for a good laugh and for a good rant.